Welcome to the Flexible Philosophy Podcast, where we sit down with leading thinkers to talk about the ways that their ideas can be put into practice. I'm your host, Hamza King, and on this episode, I'll be imagining a world without work with John Danaher, Senior Lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Galway and author of Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy listening. Across the world, students are relying on ChatGPT to write essays, companies are using machine learning to screen job applications, and content creators are using AI to enhance the audio quality of their podcasts. It's safe to say we are entering a new age of work, where many of the tasks which once required a human touch can now be done by AI systems. Imagine we one day reach a point where all human activities are carried out by AI, and we are no longer the best problem solvers on the planet. Would this be a utopian world, or a dystopian world? John Danaher has some interesting answers to these questions. His book, Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work, argues that the automation of human activities is an opportunity to attain either a cyborg utopia, by integrating ourselves with technology to compete with AI, or a virtual utopia, by creating virtual realities where we can develop and flourish without having to compete with AI. It's great to have you on, John. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure. Uh, Great to be here and to chat about these topics. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Now, your book's filled with sci-fi themes. At points, it felt like watching an episode of Star Trek. So why don't we start by being as realistic as possible about the potential of AI? There are certainly signs that AI will have a rapid and substantial impact on the workforce. Self-driving cars became a reality much quicker than expected and a forecast to displace millions of jobs over the coming decades. But over the coming century... Do you think it is likely that AI will displace all forms of human work? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, it's worth noting that I wrote this book back in, like, well, this book was published in 2019, which is four years ago as we were recording this. And I probably wrote it before that, like probably, you know, 2017, 2018. I think I had it in the manuscript in 2018. So maybe um, five or six years ago at this stage. And... If anything, like what's happened in the intervening years suggests to me that kind of more forms of human work are at risk than were at risk back then. We're living now in the kind of wake of these seemingly very impressive like generative AI systems such as GPT and its ilk, which seem to be very good at producing human-like content, kind of intellectual or cognitive content, informational content, including texts and music and video, that's on top of other kinds of developments in automated technologies such as self-driving cars, as you mentioned. So since I wrote the book, I'd say I've become more convinced that more forms of work are at risk or are threatened by AI. Where we'll be in 100 years is obviously very difficult to predict. Prediction is always hard, especially about the future. So I... I sort of back away from or resist the temptation to predict these things because I'll probably end up looking foolish. But my my current kind of intuition is that we are at a point where a significant amount of what it is that humans do, what they add to economic activity can be or is on the verge of being replaced by AI. I can imagine that being a scary thought for some people particularly those who see their job as a core part of their identity. But others might be less bothered by the prospect of a jobless future, of course. In your book, you quote the anarchist thinker Bob Black, who wrote a provocative essay in 1985 called The Abolition of Work, where he says that, Work is the source of nearly all the misery in the world. Almost any evil you'd care to name comes from working or from living in a world designed for work. In order to stop suffering, we have to stop working. Now, he draws on Marx's thought throughout the paper. Towards the end, he even says, Workers of the world, relax. So I wanted to ask whether you agree with Bob Black. Is work the source of nearly all the misery and suffering in the world? Yeah, so I mean, the core position that I defend in the book is that the abolition of work is desirable. And again, bear in mind by work, I mean that economic conditionality that attaches to the performance of tasks. So doing something in return for an economic reward or under conditions of employment, is in general, I think, a bad thing. In the book, I refer to it as being a structurally bad thing. 
that works performed under a set of kind of institutional structures that is bad for most people and actually I would argue getting worse partly as a function of technology. So I'm 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 with Bob Black to an extent in the book and I tried to defend that view in a maybe a slightly richer or more nuanced way than he might do, uh, or certainly a more analytical way than he might do. So the, the, I mean, the problems with work as I see it are fivefold. I think in the book, I have like five reasons that I think work is bad for most people. Now, many of them have to do with freedom and choice. So your work gets performed under what I would call conditions of domination for most people, that you are dominated by an employer, that you perform tasks at their will. I mean, domination in a formal philosophical sense that even if you're not kind of interfered with as a matter of your day-to-day -day working life, even if it appears like you have a lot of autonomy, there's still ultimately an employer standing in the background who can discipline you or fire you, I guess, ultimately, if you step out of line, if you step outside the boundaries of what they think is acceptable. Uh, so that's kind of one aspect of this. Um, it affects our freedom in other ways as well, insofar as it increasingly work, particularly in, let's say, the knowledge work sector, encroaches upon leisure time and time outside of work. So even though maybe the amount of time that we technically spend employed or the amount of hours that we're paid for has been going down in most countries for the past kind of hundred years, the amount of time that we spend thinking about or worrying about work has probably increased. That is both true across our lifetimes and that there's increasing anxiety about employment among teenagers and young adults because they need to get the right kind of education, develop the right set of skills, develop the right profile in order to be attractive on an economic market. They spend longer periods of time sort of training themselves to reach the point that they become eligible for good employment. And then people who actually are working, they, they might technically have nine to five jobs or eight to four or whatever it might be, but they actually spend a lot more time outside of those hours thinking about the work that they're doing or maybe being at the kind of beck and call of employers. So that's another dimension of, of unfreedom. I think what I'm going to refer to in the book is that work increasingly colonizes our mental space in the sense that it's very hard to find time in our lives or space in our lives that is genuinely free from the demands or calls of work. Uh, another aspect of work is that it contributes, I think, and increasingly contributes to inequality. There's increasing kind of polarization within the workplace in the kinds of tasks. And that, that is actually, I think, a function of technology to a large extent. And this isn't my idea. An American economist called David Order and some of his colleagues have written about this fairly frequently. And the, they've looked at it, the US data on this and other people looked at it in the European context. And it seems to hold up that essentially one of the things that really happened as a result of the information technology revolution, computerization of the workplace, is that it hollowed out the middle income set of jobs. So the middle, the middle class have been badly affected by automation and by computerization. So to be more precise, what we call like routine mid-level work that has been really quickly replaced and affected by automation. Those jobs were pretty well-paying, pretty stable forms of employment, and they're essentially decimated. And people are pushed into two other kinds of work, what order refers to as manual work, which are those kinds of physical, dexterous, hard to routinized forms of work that I alluded to previously when I mentioned hairdressing as an example of it. So that's good, a good, good illustration, but there's other kinds of you know, cleaning work even or um, uh, repair work, let's say, that are difficult still to automate given the complex physical tasks involved in performing them. But the problem with those kinds of work is that they're often subject to precarious conditions of employment and they're not particularly well paid. At the other end of the spectrum, there are what we might call kind of like creative forms of work, cognitive forms of work that require lots of education, complex kind of problem solving, high-end management jobs. They're well paid, but there's relatively few of them. So his claim is that there's this polarization of the workforce. More and more people are pushed into this lower paid manual form of work. And, you know, the handful of elite workers are pushed into this creative problem solving work and they benefit a lot from technology and from automation. The other end of the spectrum doesn't benefit so much, and the middle income section has kind of been lost as a result of this. 
Um, and so you have this contribution to inequality and polarization in the workplace. Uh, this is going to reflect it then in data on income and wealth. And again, I'm, I'm saying nothing new here. And this is a little bit dated, but um, the work done by Thomas Pickett, he and his, his colleagues in France and elsewhere, which suggests that there's going to be increasing levels of income disparity across the world and again, partly a function of technology. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's other things I mentioned like within within the book is about the increasing kind of surveillance within the workplace and a loss of autonomy and freedom as a result of that. So broadly speaking, work, I think, is problematic because it encroaches upon our freedom and autonomy, both in this sense of being under the influence of employers, this dominating influence, the increasing surveillance and management of work, the colonization of mental space, and then also inequality in work, both in conditions of employment you know, increasingly precarious, poorly re uh, rewarded forms of work and income. Yeah, the economy is a good example. Yeah, yeah. Companies like Uber. Yeah. Well, you've listed some of the reasons why work is bad. It's performed under conditions of domination, it encroaches on our leisure time, and it increasingly contributes to income inequality. But of course, for many people, work is a source of pride. People often define themselves in terms of the industry they work in and the types of work that they are doing. They also build valuable social connections and obtain social recognition for their achievements at work. So I suppose the fear is that people will lose out on these non-monetary goods associated with work if AI were to make them redundant. Now if we push these concerns about human flourishing to their extreme, we might also worry about AI interfering with other activities that imbue our lives with meaning. You mentioned Wall E in your book. For those who haven't seen the film, it follows the story of a robot dustbin working to clean up an abandoned earth while humans live gluttonous and sedentary lives aboard a spaceship where they are scooted around on hovercrafts because they are too obese to walk. I think the film offers an interesting, though rather extreme depiction of what humans might become if AI were to do everything on our behalf. And I'm interested in hearing your views on how a world without work might impact human flourishing. So this is the kind of the big issue, I guess, in the book, the one that I tried to tackle or address. It's true, despite what I said about work being bad for many people, that a lot of people do attach meaning, self-worth, social worth to the jobs that they perform. And that if they lost their jobs, they would suffer from a significant kind of existential crisis. They wouldn't know what their role is in society. They wouldn't be able to maybe provide for their families. They wouldn't feel any kind of sense of pride over their lives. They might be kind of listless and bored and wondering what they should do. So that seems like a significant problem. Now you might say, well, they could be freed up to do other things in their lives, uh, you know, kind of pursue their own ideal of the good, whether that's like, would they all become novelists or they pursue whatever their hobbies or happen to be. Uh, not everyone has to be a novelist, of course, or a musician. The danger there is that, okay, it, it would be great if the impact of AI would stay purely within the workspace or it would only affect the things that we do as part of our work. But given that the impact of AI is on tasks, not on work per se, it's possible that AI will actually negatively impact on many of the things that we would otherwise do to achieve kind of flourishing or meaning in life. Okay. So it's hard to keep the impact of AI confined purely to work. It's likely to spill over into other aspects of our lives and therefore kind of negatively impact on our, our human flourishing as well. I mean, I, I discussed this in uh, more detail in the book. I like doing things in fives for some reason. This wasn't uh, intentional or designed, but I think I have like five problems with technology outside of work. Um, maybe the, the kind of big ones or the, the important ones are agency and the connection to what is meaningful. So, so the idea is that usually philosophers talk about three different theories of what it is that makes for a meaningful or flourishing life. You can have like a purely subjectivist theory, which is that the only thing that really matters is that you feel very happy and fulfilled in what you're doing. And in principle, if you adopted a purely subjectivist theory of, of meaning, all that matters is your subjective feelings. Plugging someone into a virtual reality headset or a kind of deep brain stimulation device that constantly triggers their pleasure response or something, that would be kind of like meaningful life. Yeah, kind of like, well, like wireheading their kind of pleasure response, almost like a technological form of, of heroin or something. They're very happy all the time, but, you know, it doesn't look to us like a very kind of meaningful life, right? So in lieu of that purely subjectivist account, 
a lot of philosophers talk about an objectivist theory of meaning. So it's it's not just like that you feel good. It's that you do things that make a difference to the world, that provide some kind of value to the world. So the classical theory of it is in, in terms of the so-called the good, the true, and the beautiful. So you either do things that are good, morally good, make the world better in that kind of moral sense, alleviate other people's suffering, perform your duties to, towards others, or you contribute to knowledge and understanding of the world, the true, so you become like you know, one of these gentlemen scientists of history like Charles Darwin it didn't work a day in his life in a sense because he was provided with an income by his father, but obviously he spent all his time focusing on his science and he, in a sense he, he worked hard on that uh, and that was what provided him with meaning. So maybe we could all become like those Victorian gentlemen scientists and um, have a very kind of meaningful life contributing to scientific understanding or any other understanding, the true. Or else the beautiful, we contribute more to aesthetics. You know, we produce works of art, music for our own pleasure or the pleasure of certain communities of people. But these are objectively valuable things that we do. So the danger with AI is that it actually cuts us off from or severs our connection with these things that are valuable in the world. Just to close the loop. So the other there were the three theories of, of meaning. So there's that kind of subjectivist view, there's an objectivist view, there's also like a hybrid view where what matters is that you're subjectively fulfilled and happy by doing things that are objectively valuable. So you have to combine the two together in some way. Broadly speaking, I, I certainly favor objectivist and hybrid theories of meaning. Probably I'm more on the kind of hybrid school that I think you have to be subjectively fulfilled by doing things that are valuable. And the danger with, with AI and automating technologies more generally is that they kind of sever us from things that are valuable because they replace our agency and they do things on our behalf. So instead of you producing the artwork, the AI produces the artwork. Instead of you writing the song, the AI writes the song. Instead of you designing the experiment or coming up with the hypothesis, the AI can design the experiment to come up with the hypothesis and maybe write the scientific paper that summarizes the results of it. So suddenly these things that were traditionally sources of meaning and that you might say, well, we'll have more time for all of these things in a world without work or with lots of automation, they're negatively impacted by technology too. This also then is compounded by certain other dangers that technology poses. And I suppose like one of the ones that I would mention in particular is just how technology affects our capacity to focus and pay attention to things that are important. And we all, we all experience this and understand this in our daily lives, that like to some extent, the kind of online digital information economy that we've created is one that possibly preys upon or hones some of our worst instincts in the sense that it, it uh, rewards people who are kind of easily distracted, you know, social media, it's there to distract us and to have lots of, kind of short-term hits of content, you know, amusing TikTok videos or memes that we spend all our time scrolling through feeds to find these things instead of, you know, focusing on the good, the true and the beautiful. So we're distracted by these kind of trivial things and that kind of maybe affects our ability to direct our agency towards things of objective value. And yeah, as I say, like most people, I think experience that in their day-to-day -day lives that this is a problem with the technology that we've created is that it, it actually encourages or develops maybe our lazier instincts or instincts that are don't contribute to our flourishing and meeting. So you have those two things. You have the, and I have a technology that can sever our connection between what we do and what is meaningful and also a technology that rewards, develops, or holds capacities that are antithetical to meaning and flourishing. Okay, so on one hand, you're saying that it would be good for AI to carry out more of the tasks that we do at work, or to even replace humans entirely from the workforce. But on the other hand, you're saying that if AI does develop to this point, then there is a real risk it could inhibit our capacity to live in fulfilling ways, because it could sever our connection to objectively good activities, which we have traditionally used to find meaning. Now, you relate these developments in AI to the concept of a cognitive niche. Could you explain what a cognitive niche is, and how it is relevant to the point you were making? So the, the thing with the cognitive niche, that's, again, look, this isn't my idea. This is an idea from evolutionary anthropology. So some 
evolutionary anthropologists argue that what is distinctive about human beings is that we evolved to fill a cognitive niche. And so this is an idea that you get in evolutionary theory more generally, that ecological systems, environmental systems consist of niches and animals can evolve to fill those niches. So, you know, if you're on a plane with lots of trees that have leaves on them, there's a niche there for an animal that has a long neck and can reach the succulent leaves at the top of the tree. And so giraffes evolved to fill that ecological niche. All right. So the cognitive niche is the niche that involves using our brains to solve problems, basically. So, so the idea is that humans evolved to fill the cognitive niche to develop kind of big brains that could solve problems. And I mean, it should be noted that that's understood not so much on an individualistic level. It's not that individuals developed kind of these super cognitive abilities to solve problems, but actually communities of humans did. So there's a kind of collective intelligence to humans that fills this cognitive niche. So the idea in the book, I just I take that from evolutionary theory and I say, well, the problems we're discussing in the book to this point and in this conversation to this point about the threat to work and the threat to meaning and flourishing, those can be understood in relation to this cognitive niche. And that what's happened to humanity is that we have evolved to fill this cognitive niche and that's how we think about our work. We use our brains to work to perform tasks and to define roles within the economy. And we use our brains as also as a way of pursuing meaning and flourishing. And so if we're not kind of fully engaged within the cognitive niche, there's nothing for us to do and there's nothing that will contribute to our flourishing. And the problem now is that we are creating machines that perhaps threaten our place within the cognitive niche. They're pushing us out of the cognitive niche. They're actually better able to fulfill that role. So I'm kind of reframing the problem that we've discussed so far in these kind of larger terms, kind of thinking about it in a larger historical sense, that our dominance of the cognitive niche is now under threat. And so the, the idea I have in the book is that well, there's kind of two potential paths out of this. And I mean, just to be clear, when I say there's two paths, that's clearly an oversimplification. To suggest there's only two paths out of it is wrong, there's probably many different paths out of it, but they can be grouped under two broad headings, that's what I say. So we, we either we either kind of double down on the cognitive niche and try to retain our dominance within the cognitive niche, or we move away and try to do something else with our lives. So that's that's the idea I have in the book, that there's two pathways out, doubling down on the cognitive niche and moving out of the cognitive niche. Am I a particular names for those visions or those uh, responses? which we can come back to in a moment. Yeah, so you suggest two solutions in the book. The first is a cyborg utopia, where we integrate ourselves with technology to compete with AI. Now, I was surprised to learn that there are already cyborgs in existence and that these individuals take their cyborg status very seriously. Many are already campaigning for, and I found this phrase quite amusing, cyborg rights. That is, the right not to be discriminated against based on one's cyborg identity. You mentioned the artist Neil Harbison, who has an extreme form of colorblindness, which means he sees the world in a dull gray scale. Harbison has an antenna implanted into the back of his skull, which allows him to perceive color as sound. In his own words, the antenna allows me to detect light's hue and convert it into a frequency that I can hear as a note. Now, as amazing as that sounds, I think most people, including myself, find it almost impossible to imagine what that would feel like. It's so far removed from normal sensory experience. But is this the kind of thing you're imagining? Would a cyborg utopia involve having antennas inserted into the back of our skulls like Neil Harbison? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm envisaging a, a future in which humans become so kind of integrated with technology that the human plus technology forms a kind of single system. So, you know, at the moment you might think of John plus his smartphone or his laptop as being kind of two separate things that are easily disentangled. I'm thinking of a future in which the, the technology and the human, they're much more closely associated and integrated that it's, you can't really think about them as being separate entities. They are kind of just one single functioning system or unit. So like people like, such as Neil Harbison is an artist. And I mean, to some extent, you could argue that the kind of cyborg implant that he has and that some of his colleagues and friends have similar or slightly different functioning cyborg implants. Maybe they are sort of like extended art projects in the sense that they themselves are an art installation. I don't know if they would think of it in that way, but it seems to be part of like a kind of artistic or expressive 
mode of, of relating to the world, they are kind of like integrated systems in so far as like how they experience to understand the world. They understand it through the lens of a technology that is essentially like welded to their biology. Either they have chips implanted under their skin or this kind of cyborg artifact, which is grafted into the back of their skulls. Right. And you describe this as a technical vision of a cyborg, one where we are integrating human biology with technology to become a unified system. You then contrast this to a more metaphorical vision of a cyborg, where humans are combined with artifacts to form a single system, but physical integration with technology is not necessary. If I use a calculator to solve a math problem, for example, there is a sense in which I am integrating myself with technology to improve my performance, even though the calculator is separate from my physical being. On this metaphorical vision, many people would already be classified as cyborgs, but on the technical vision, only those who have made major biological changes would qualify. Now, you mentioned that the term cyborg emerged in discussions around space exploration and how one of the advantages of pursuing a technical vision of a cyborg is that it could allow us to establish an interplanetary civilization. We discussed space exploration on the last episode, so it would be great to hear your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, sure. I mean, so yeah, the, the actual origin of the term, the etymological origin of the term cyborg, which just means kind of cybernetic organism, is from a paper by two academics. I, I won't remember their first names because um, this is kind of ordinary for academics who just remember people by their surnames. Um, so Kleins and Kleins, they wrote this paper back in the 60s, I think, about overcoming the challenges of space exploration. problem for humans is that the human biology is not very well equipped to the harsh environment of space. And they say, well, there's two ways of overcoming that, whether we build kind of better protective spaceships that shield us from the harshness of that environment, or we integrate ourselves with technology in such a way that uh, we become less susceptible, less vulnerable to the harshness of the space environment. That's the cyborg approach. So that, that's the origin of the term. It's, it's taken on a life after that. So there are a variety of advantages to pursuing this kind of cyborg utopia. And so we're, where we just pursue this closer and closer integration with technology so that, that human plus technology forms a single system, not two oppositional systems to things that are in tension with one another. I mean, it could have resolved, again, the severance problem that I spoke to earlier on, that, you know, what we do and what the machine does, it severs us from what is objectively valuable. Well, that no longer is true if the humans and the technology perform a single system, where it means that the achievements of the technology are kind of your achievements, in a sense, now. So that that seems to be kind of an advantage of it. It also has other advantages. So, yes, Space exploration, I do mention as being one of them. So if you go back to the concept or idea of utopia, and I mentioned that you have this kind of dynamic open future, well, one of the problems with the future, if we continue to live on Earth, is that it is, in some sense, closed. I mean, the timescales here are vast. It's not going to be closed for several billion years in a a strict sense. Maybe in a sense of ecological collapse, it might close sooner, um, if we look at problems around climate change and environmental degradation, so we will need to perhaps escape planet to survive that. I appreciate that talking in those terms raises hackles amongst people who are concerned about climate change. So, you know, when I say that, I'm not saying it because I think we should abandon the idea of pursuing climate mitigation strategies on Earth. I'm just saying that uh, one way of perhaps escaping the limitations of the biosphere is, is through space exploration, ultimately. So that seems like a potential advantage of, of the cyborg utopia, that you have that more kind of open, dynamical future. You know, I think there are independent merits or intrinsic goods associated with space exploration, too, in terms of scientific understanding, uh, expanding our horizons, you know, developing human ingenuity, and all that kind of thing. And then you know, there's other, other potential advantages of the cyborg utopia, just in terms of maybe making us more existentially robust. So not not in the sense that we'll become immortal or anything like that, but you know, one of the problems with human biological systems is that they degrade and we all die ultimately. You know, perhaps we can reduce our susceptibility or our, to degradation by pursuing this cyborg strategy. So there seems to be a lot of potential advantages to cyborgization when you look at it in those kind of utopian terms. It addresses some of the problems that I mentioned earlier with human flourishing in the age of automation, because we're no longer opposed to the machine, we are machines. And you can pursue this more open, dynamical future with greater existential robustness. 
So the idea is that through becoming cyborgs we could retain dominance of the cognitive niche by escaping Earth and starting anew elsewhere in the solar system. Pursuing this technical vision of cyborgization would also make us more existentially robust, fending off concerns about biological and ecological degradation. Now, the other solution you suggest is a virtual utopia, which involves retreating to virtual realities where we can do things which give our lives meaning without having to compete with AI. When I got to this part of your book, I was reminded of the Steven Spielberg film Ready Player One. Have you seen it? I have seen the film, yeah. It's set in 2045. Earth has become a kind of wasteland full of misery and crime, so people escape to a virtual reality game called Oasis, where they can socialise with other players and fine-tune their skills by completing missions. It's a good film. More of a dystopia than a utopia, though. I don't suppose you're imagining a world like this. Yeah, um, so look, I mean, in terms of social or cultural connotations or connections, it's, it's fair to say that most depictions or understandings of virtual environments, again, probably lean into the dystopian. There's a, there's a, a larger conversation to be had here about like why so much science fiction is dystopian. Is that just because dystopian plots are more entertaining and, you know, a future in which everything's wonderful just isn't particularly exciting and nobody wants to watch that. Uh, so, you know, it could be that case. But yeah, like, um, yeah, most cultural depictions of virtual environments are fairly dystopian for sure. Another example, classic example is something like The Matrix. You know, maybe this is a, showing my age more. <laughs> um, but, you know, the humans are all kind of living inside a virtual environment while they are used essentially as an energy source for artificial intelligence, right? That's the, the essential core plot of that movie. I, I do mention this in the book, and I well, hasten to add that I mentioned this before Mark Zuckerberg changed the name of his company to reflect this, but uh, Neil Stevenson's book from the early 90s, I think Snow Crash, where he talks about the metaverse, right? That's where that concept comes from. It comes from that, that novel. It also depicts this kind of future of, of where everyone, where a lot of people spend a lot of time inside a virtual environment, and it is also a quasi- dystopian future insofar as well a oh, spoiler alert there's a a kind of a, a bug or a virus spread around inside the virtual environment that affects people in a negative way however you know there are some depictions of uh, virtual environments in science fiction which are possibly more optimistic or utopian um you know let's say like the the holodeck in star trek is a kind of virtual environment which seems like a, a lot of fun although it is also fair to say that most of the plot points related to the holodeck in Star Trek involve something going terribly wrong inside that environment. So I have to qualify that in certain ways. So yeah, I think I think you're right to to kind of maybe go to those maybe more negative visions of it. And you know, I'm, this kind of maybe links as well to this like Wally problem that you mentioned earlier on. Whereas you know, I get in the Wally future, humans are become disgustingly obese and they ride around on these hover chairs and watch kind of stupid light entertainment and eat fast food all the time. And some people worry about that as being like, what will happen to us if we pursue virtual reality or virtual futures, though we just plug into these machines and become passive, stupid beings in some sense. Uh, we're just kind of fed stimulation, fed information, but we don't really do anything of importance. And for the philosophers out there, this is sort of the main idea behind something like Robert Nozick's The Experience Machine Thought Experiment. He had this challenge to people, you know, if you could plug into a machine where you live out a life that seems great to you, but is all inside a machine, would you do it? And his intuition was that, no, of course you wouldn't because you want your life to have some connection with something of greater kind of value or meaning than just purely your subjective experience of it. So yeah, there's a lot of negativity associated with virtual utopias. And what I was trying to do in the book was to dispel some of that and argue in favor of the virtual utopia. And again, the part of my strategy here is to engage in some kind of like conceptual analysis and problematizing or making more complex the idea of what counts as a virtual utopia. Because again, I think there's a distinction between what I would call like a technological vision of a virtual utopia and a slightly more metaphorical one. Um, so a technological vision is very much this like Ready Player One metaverse model where a virtual utopia, what we do is we just kind of plug into a headset or something like this, or more fancifully like a Star Trek type holodeck where you're not plugging into something, but there's a, a fake environment is projected around you and we kind of live largely to a large extent in, in that environment. 
where nothing is real and everything is maybe controlled by other people. Um, and that doesn't seem seem too enticing. Conversely, I, I do think like there's a way of thinking about a virtual utopia which is more subtle. Like a, a virtual environment is one that is somehow cut off from or insulated from some of the rigors of physical reality. And I would argue to a large extent, like human history is characterized by the desire to construct virtual environments where we create increasingly kind of like technologized or technologically insulated worlds that free us from or shield us from or protect us from the harshness of physical reality. So like in a sense, I'm I'm living in a quasi kind of virtual environment right now because I'm inside like a, a centrally heated home. We're recording this not in, in the depths of winter or anything like this, so it's not that the central heating is needed. But, uh, you know, I have artificial light sources everywhere. I don't have to go outside where it's very, um, very windy today, a bit of rain. So I'm protected from those, those things, if you know what I mean. So in some sense, we're, we're always creating these kind of virtual environments. And uh, more technically, our maybe conceptually complex idea is that a lot of, kind of human social life, people would argue, is virtual insofar as it involves the construction of not real constraints onto human social life. Like a lot of our social roles, it's not that we physically or literally occupy those roles, but they are kind of imposed upon us or projected onto us by others. Um, so being married, what does it mean to be married? It's not like anything physically changes in who you are or your partner is. It's rather that society has invented this kind of fictional role, this institutional role that it imposes upon you and enforces in certain ways. A better example might be something like money. This is a longer debate, but like money, I would say, is largely a virtual concept. And the obviousness of that is clearer to us now than maybe it was to uh, historical communities. But, you know, money is not like a precious metal or a gold. It is rather, we say that something has value and we use it to exchange for goods and services. And it's just kind of a collective hallucination or agreement to that this thing has value and this thing can be used as money. So it's a sort of virtual concept. So... The longest order was that actually virtuality is a feature of human civilization for a very long time. It doesn't necessarily have to exist inside a computer simulated environment. And if you embrace this broader sense of the virtual, I think there's more reason to be optimistic about it. Okay, so to bring this all together now, if AI does eventually become more intelligent than humans and displaces us from the cognitive niche, you suggest that we could pursue two utopian worlds. The first is a cyborg utopia, and the second is a virtual utopia. But I'm not entirely sure which of these you would prefer, or whether the two options are mutually exclusive. Could we not be cyborgs by day, then plug into our virtual worlds at night? Yeah, like what I would say is that it's probably true that they're not necessarily in opposition to one another, that you could pursue both. I mean, the only thing I would say in the and I do mention this in the book, perhaps a question of like feasibility and timelines. I think certainly if you're pursuing like a technical vision of the cyborg, where it is this integration between human biology and technology, you know, microchip and brain circuits, let's say, there's some hard like engineering problems to overcome there, which we are don't seem to be particularly close to overcoming. And so the timeline for actually creating cyborgs in a more science fictional sense seems far away and the actual kind of incremental gains that we have in terms of cyborgization so far seem relatively minimal and so it seems like the virtual utopia is maybe a more realistic prospect in the short to medium term uh, that doesn't mean that the cyborg utopia shouldn't be considered seriously and that, as far as i recall in the book I, I do actually mention that they are not necessarily in opposition to one another and that you could pursue both even if the virtual utopia is a more realistic prospect in the short to medium term. Well, I look forward to living in a world where video games take center stage. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, John. It's been great chatting. Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about these issues. If you're interested in the deeper philosophical questions around the future of work, subscribe to our newsletter for an extended interview where John and I discuss the concept of utopia and the ways that AI is already changing the workforce. 